Okay, back of the room, can you hear me? Raise your hand. I just want to make sure that this thing is on. So, I'm going to be talking about the end of time, the end of the universe, the end of everything that exists. It's kind of a downer of a topic, don't you think? I mean, especially after the wonderful last talk we had. I'm going to be talking about existential apocalypse. Not only will things cease to exist, but the very category of existence will cease to exist. I think of it like reading a novel. And you reach the last page of the novel, and you've been involved in the characters' lives. You turn the last page, and you put the novel up on the shelf, or you tell your friends about it. Where's the character at that point? The very conditions under which the character needed to be alive just don't exist. They don't exist outside the pages by definition. And the end of life, the end of time, will be something like that as well, as is the end of life as well, which I'll talk about. So why would we want to think about something so morbid? Well, first of all, there's the morbid fascination that we all have. At least I have. I watch zombie movies. I love post-apocalyptic dramas with robots attacking humans and all that kind of stuff. It's fun. Imagine yourself in a world that's just gone to hell. But there's a more serious purpose here, and it connects with this theme of innovation, which is, I think, the reason I'm involved in this. The end of time poses a paradox as I'll get into. It can both end and not end. And whenever you have a paradox, you should just cheer, yay, I found a paradox. Your day is complete if you found that paradox because that's how you push physics and philosophy and the other areas of human endeavor forward. So by encountering something that doesn't make sense in your current way of thinking, you have to transcend that way of thinking. In this case, we need to transcend questions of time. What the heck is time? We never have enough of it. We're obsessed by it. We live in time. We're temporal creatures, but do we know what it even means? That's the question we'll try to get at. So let me begin, and this is actually in honor of a speaker who will be performing right after lunch, percussion. I was inspired by the fact I'm with that person today. Because I think of the main theory we have of time and space in percussive terms. So that theory, which comes to us from Albert Einstein, is all these things tend to do, all the questions that animate physics come from him, ultimately. Uh, it's a general theory of relativity. This is the theory of gravity. Why do we fall? Why? And in Einstein's point of view, gravity is because gravity occurs, we fall, because of the warping of space and the warping of time. Now, here's how I think of it percussively. This is the old Newtonian view of time. Just ticks by. An external clock to the universe is ticking very boringly, never stopping, ever. That's the Einstein view. It's a rhythmic view of time. Where everybody, everyone here, by virtue of the matter that's around you, has a different sense of the passage of time. And in fact, it's, it's, it's musical because there's improvisation going on. The drummer is improvising off the guitarists, and they're improvising off the, the dancers on the dance floor, and the drummer is feeding on himself, and it's this one big, happy, polyrhythmic jam session. That's the Einstein view of time. That's why we, are felt, we feel this acceleration toward the center of the Earth. By virtue of the mass and energy that's there, time passes more slowly at the center of the Earth. And if you work it through, that's why you feel this pull. So, if you move from this kind of view, where time just goes on eternally, ba da 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 whatever, to a poly more polyrhythmic one, you open up the possibility that time could just end, or begin. And those places where it begins and ends are called space-time singularities. The Big Bang. That's the beginning of time in our universe, according to relativity theory. Black holes. They've got a space-time singularity inside them. So, you fall into a black hole. And if you don't live under a rock, you know that if you fall into a black hole, it's over. You're going to die. What you probably don't know, and what's not emphasized in the popular accounts of this, is it's much, much worse. It's that existential apocalypse. When you hit the center of the black hole, the space-time singularity that's there, you're not only dead, but your timeline has ended. So normally when we die, we... Uh, our genes will carry on, our memes will carry on, we can send a sugar cube, we can, our atoms at least will carry on. Something of us will carry on in the world. 
But when you hit that center of the black hole, nope, your timeline is ended. You're like that character at the end of a novel. And this kind of thing in a black hole happens in a very localized way, but also could happen in the entire universe. So when I took graduate course in cosmology 20 years ago, these were the two choices we had for the fate of the universe, the end of time in a sense. Big crunch and the big whimper. Okay, the big crunch. It's easy conceptually to understand. The universe bangs out and crunches inward because of all the gravity that's pulling it back. Obviously, time finite in that case. Big whimper. Okay, the universe doesn't have enough matter in it to pull its expansion back. It just keeps going, 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 forever. In that case, actually, you might think that time goes on eternally, but as we'll talk about in a minute, there's a sense so much time ends in the big whimper case, too. So what's happened since those wonderful graduate school days of working all day, all weekend, 24 hours a day, it seems, is we've, just, cosmologists in general, have discovered dark energy. We are swimming. We are infused by dark energy. It's what drives the expansion of the universe faster and faster and faster and faster. It causes it to accelerate. And depending on the behavior of the dark energy in the future, you open up a bunch of new scenarios which you can go to your thesaurus because you want to use that word big all the time and choose other ways that time could end. Different kinds of singularities. Okay, so your question at this point might be, ah, big deal. Einstein's theory predicts the end of time. I guess we're just going to have to deal with it. You know, we we'll deal with a lot of weird things in physics. God knows. But here's the, where we get into the paradox. This is what the laws of physics look like conceptually. They're called dynamical laws. They are laws that operate within time. That's the problem. Okay. They take the laws like F equals MA equals M E equals MC squared, all those laws you've heard and read, studied. They take the world as it is and tell you what the world will be. That the moon will move from here to there. Or you throw this thing up in the air and it'll arc and land. Or conversely, by the way, they'll work the other way. They can tell you, though I don't have it here, the world as it is and what the world was tiny moment ago, to, such as to get you where you are. So there are laws that operate within time. They presume it, and yet they're telling you time goes away. How, uh, how can that be? There's a paradox. John Wheeler was a famous physicist who were, actually I think worked on the Manhattan Project and other projects, and he formulated the kind of dilemma that physicists face, that time most both can and can't end. In fact, in a sense, time must end according to the, th to the theory, and yet time mustn't end. There's a specific mathematical way to think about this. There, that dot, is a scale model of a space-time singularity. Actually, because of the limitations of PowerPoint, it's way too big. The actual space-time singularity is that big. I can't even do it. It's an infinitesimal point. Teeny point. Zero size. So imagine what happens as you fall into that point, as you fall into a black hole, God forbid. Your entire body gets scrunched into that tiny point. Heck, forget the body, the entire universe, everything into that tiny point or something even small that you can't conceive of. So what happens? The density becomes infinite. The pressure, infinite. Gravity, infinite. The quantities we talk about in physics mind-blowingly infinite. And whenever in physics you come to an infinity, it's a sign you've done something wrong. It's a sign that your theory needs to be augmented or extended or just thrown in the garbage can altogether. In the case of general relativity theory, it's taken as a sign that we need to move, we, humanity, needs to move to a quantum theory of gravity. This is this unification that you always read about. People are trying to unify Einstein's theory with quantum theory and create the new theory and one of the main impetuses for that, though it's not usually talked about, is this end of time problem. So actually, in that theory, that may well be a scale model of the singularity. The singularity gets kind of fuzzed out a little bit. It's resolved, is the word that people use. And then when you fall in, you still get scrunched down, you still die, etc. But at least time doesn't end. In a sense, your atoms or whatever your atoms turn into will carry on. There will still be an imprint of you in the world. In principle, some distant descendant could reconstruct you not that they would. So, in that case, you may say, ah, okay, you told me time must end, now time uh, mustn't end, again, what's the big deal? Well, again, look what I've just done. I've taken infinity, the infinite density, 
and exchange it for another infinity, the infinity in time, the eternality of the universe according to that resolved singularity picture. And that poses its own difficulties. For instance, we think of the disorder of the universe, the entropy in the universe is continually increasing, 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 increasing. But if it's been increasing for an infinite amount of time, it should be infinite or maxed out in some sense. So again, we have this weird paradox. So I'm going to offer a, a synthesis of various views in physics that I've tried to put together to try to make sense of, of this, this conundrum that we face. And the basic idea, basic idea is this, that the paradox of the end of time doesn't come from the end per se, but it comes from the abruptness of the end. So maybe if we could not make the end so just abrupt, cut off, we'd somehow be able to think about time ending and be able to conceptualize that. And the example that I like to give is to life. When does life begin or end? We heard a talk earlier about the organs of life. When do we know that life has begun or when at the other side do we know it's ended? Is it ended when your heart stops? Well, no, we know that's not the case anymore because doctors can bring you back. Is it when the brain stops? Which part of the brain? Lower brain, upper brain? The key thing is that life is a process. In modern science and philosophy, we don't think of life vitalistically anymore. That's something out there that comes into here. It's something that arises from within matter. Life is a property of emergence from within matter. It reflects the organization that matter has, the way the atoms interlock like gears of a machine. It's a mechanistic view. Maybe time's like that too. Maybe time arises from the ordering of the building blocks of nature, something deeper giving rise to this notion that we have of time. And if you can imagine time uh, as a process in that way, you can imagine how it might dribble away little by little. And it's difficult to conceptualize because the dribbling, the inging, is occurring within time. But there's ways that we can try to get a handle on that that I'll go into. So here's how I think of it. Here's a timeline of my stay all too short in this beautiful city. So it illustrates the different qualities that time has. First of all, there's the arrow of time. Time's going from past to present to the future. Then there's the scale. I've marked out time in days here, seconds, whatever. Time comes in units. Then there's this, and this is more subtle, but extremely, extremely important in Einstein's theory. Time distinguishes cause from effect. So I can't give my talk until I've arrived here. And I presumably can't depart until I've arrived either. And what's crucial about that is the cause-effect distinctions are objective. No matter what kind of observations you make, as long as you make them competently, you will always see, everyone in this room will always observe the same sequence of cause and effect. And that's what time does. It gives us the objectivity of cause-effect relations. It's something very deep. And then there's just simple, the fact that I can express this geometric form at all. I can lay out a timeline and put events at given moments on that timeline. It's not all obvious that you can do that. So let's, let's get rid of these one by one. One of the great realizations of 19th century physics is that the arrow of time, which I've now taken away, if you've been sharp-eyed, is not a property of time. It's a property of things within time. Time itself is bidirectional. But the way matter is arranged, it goes from being ordered to disordered, marks out the arrow of time. And in the far, far, far future of the universe, or as we approach the big whimper, even a big crunch, the universe will approach a state of thermal equilibrium, what's called heat death. Heat death. All the available universe, uh, universe's energy will be used up. There will be no clear progression possible. Things that happen will unhappen, happen, up and happen. There will never be no past to future. Duration. I've taken that away now. And now I can't mark out units in time, at least schematically here. Where does the notion of duration come from? Also comes from matter. Earth going around the sun, the earth spinning on its axis, the clock ticking around, all material systems. So one thing that will happen is the universe will, the galaxy will dissipate, solar system break apart, those bound systems will break apart. Worse, black holes, as they take material in, if you fall in, sorry, take you in, will convert you to pure energy, photons of light, and photons have no mass, they have no scale, 
There's no pendulum you can build from a photon. Duration will go away in the far future. More subtly, you can see here I switched around those labels there. Cause-effect relationships will go away as well. And you could imagine someone might see me depart before I even give my talk. That would be totally weird. And there's ways to do this. Basically, what would happen is a space-time continuum would become the space-space continuum. It would actually just turn one of those dimensions of the time dimension into a space dimension. And finally, even the geometry could go away. And there's models for how this could happen as you approach the space-time singularity in a center of a black hole. The very notion of moments of time, positions in space, just go away. And what's interesting about that is you could still continue, this is interesting for physicists, you could still continue to describe the evolution of the universe, but you couldn't use geometry anymore. You couldn't conceptualize it, you couldn't visualize it at all as occurring within a space-time continuum. You'd have to move to an algebra or something more abstract. And that would complete the end of time. It happened progressively. There's no moment at which you could say, up, oh, time ended, because it happened little by little. And maybe I'm suggesting that paradoxes might evaporate in that case. So this is something I've never talked about publicly. Even when I was rehearsing last night here, I'd never talked about this publicly before, and that was my motivation for writing this article. It was a few years ago when I did an article pulling all that, these ideas together. And I was thinking a lot about ends in that time, because my father was dying at that time. He actually died before this article could appear. And it's, as anyone who's gone through that, it's very difficult to process your grief. I found it useful to process it by thinking of my mortality in a cosmic context. Because think about it. Life and death, they're intertwined. You can't have life without death. That's the message of, of what my talk today what, what is. But think about it. As I metabolize sugar, as I give off heat, I'm contributing, we all are, to the heat death of the universe. We're killing the universe by living. But here's how I think about it. I flip it on its head. The universe is sacrificing itself to give us a moment of life, precious moment. And all we can do to repay that is to try to understand it. And I hope I've tried to help you understand it today. Thank you.